In this first lesson, we're going to begin by looking at an overview of pacemakers, including some of the basics of cardiac pacing and general pacing indications. Advances in cardiac surgery near the mid 20th century created a need for an artificial means of stimulating the heart muscle. Initially developed as large external devices, technological advances resulted in miniaturization of electronic circuitry and the eventual development of completely implantable devices. Artificial pacemakers now exist as a routine, safe, and sophisticated treatment used around the world. They are considered one of the great medical inventions of the 20th century. As we go through this lecture, try to fill in each of the blanks. We'll go over them at the end, but try to follow along and fill them in as we go. So in general, implanted pacemakers can sense, they can inhibit, and they can trigger the intrinsic cardiac activity. In other words, they can detect the electrical activity of the heart and stimulate it to contract at a faster rate. They can even control the heart rate and AV nodal delay to modulate rate responsiveness. Nevertheless, pacemakers are far from benign and carry their own risks and potential adverse effects. With the widespread use of pacemakers and increasing trend towards use of cardiac devices, it is important to be familiar with what they do and how they work. Let's review some of the basic concepts of cardiac pacing and general indications for their clinical use. If you recall, normal cardiac activity begins in the sinus node, where the cells with intrinsic automaticity act as pacemaker cells. Electrical wave fronts then spread across the atria to the AV node, which they pass through to the uh, enter the his Purkinje system to rapidly spread and depolarize the ventricles. When intrinsic cardiac automaticity or conduction integrity fails, the electrical excitability of cardiac tissue allows a small external electrical stimulus to drive myocytes to a threshold, thereby depolarizing uh, neighboring myocytes and propagating the electrical front and near simultaneous muscular contraction. Pacemakers essentially provide an external stimulus uh, that helps conduct through the heart. And so if we review our conduction system here, if we just make this bigger for a second, take a look here, okay? So what you have here are your four chambers of the heart. So we'll label them. Here's your right atrium. You have your left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. And then you have your conduction system that sits on top. Notice that you also have your superior vena cava here and you have your inferior vena cava there. Both deoxygenated blood supplying coming back to the right side of the heart. And so what we have here is near that superior vena cava, up in that right atrium, you have this sinus node. So the sinus node sits there, and what you then have are these internodal fibers, these ones here, that are coming through into this AV node there. You also have this that comes over to the left atrium, that interatrial depolarization to the left atrium by what's called a Bachman bundle. So from the sinus node, you go to this AV node. And from the AV node, you have what's called his bundle. So this is the bundle of his or his bundle. And then you're starting to innervate the, the ventricular myocardium. And so going to the right side, down this right path, you have what's called the right bundle branch. So that's the right bundle branch, which is this here, innervating that right ventricle. And then from on the other side, the left side, you have a left bundle branch, okay? So, and then it has a few fascicles. This is an anterior fascicle and a posterior fascicle. The anterior fascicle supplies the anterior and superior portions of the left ventricle, while the posterior fascicle supplies the inferior and posterior components of the left ventricle. And so from these branches, the bundle branches and its uh, corresponding fascicles on the left side, you have ventricular Purkinje fibers that then spread through the conduction system. Okay, and that's essentially our normal conduction system. And so we're saying when there's inactivity or failure of the conduction system to work, this is when the pacemaker can come in, provide a stimulus, and then conduct through. So say our sinus node is not working, you have sinus node dysfunction, then you can have some atrial, okay, stimulus. So you put a lead here, and if you look here, you may take a pacemaker, this one's here in the right ventricle. You may have one here in the right atrium that stimulates the atria to conduct through if there's a, no AV conduction disease. But you can imagine if this AV node is also out, then conducting or transmitting an impulse to the atrium that cannot bypass the air is not helpful. And so in such cases, you may also pace the atria as well as the ventricles.
So hopefully that makes sense. And we'll start to look at that a little more as we move forward. Now, failure of the sinus node to generate impulses or failure of the electrical conduction system to transmit impulses may lead to bradycardia or even asystole. In such cases, this is where latent pacemakers typically take over pacemaking function to prevent asystole by establishing an escape rhythm. And while these escape rhythms can be life-saving, they have two fundamental shortcomings or limitations. The first one is that the escape rhythms established by latent pacemakers have a lower frequency, okay? So that's one of the first shortcomings of it, okay? So they have a lower frequency. And as a result of this, this can result in a lower cardiac output and thereby causing symptoms. The other limitation is that these escape rhythms are established by a latent pacemaker, are often unreliable in the long-term use. And because of this, they may cease and result in, as we mentioned, asystole. So therefore, as you may expect, uh, pacemakers are indicated if the impulse formation or impulse conduction is impaired. So formation and conduction, if that's impaired, that may be an indication for pacemakers. And we can see it with such as in patients with symptomatic bradycardia. Now, a common cause of defective impulse formation is sinus node dysfunction. So the sinus node not working. And a common cause of defective impulse conduction was AV block, so AV conduction defect. The modern pacemakers are very sophisticated and can take over the roles of impulse formation and impulse conduction. And we're going to start to learn that they can adapt their function to the heart's own activity by sensing as well as uh, the needs of the body through rate responsiveness. They can also detect and treat tachyarrhythmias. And there's a lot we're going to learn here, but it'll certainly be worth it. So let's review what we discussed and start to fill in those missing blanks that uh, we have here. So the first one, uh, as we were mentioning, was what is this artificial means of stimulating heart? Well, as we expect, this is the pacemaker, okay? So the pacemaker is an artificial means of stimulating the heart. Remember, they deliver electrical current at a predetermined intervals to the heart, and they can result in cardiac depolarization followed by myocardial contraction. Remember, it's an electro, the depolarization, followed by a mechanical component. So the depolarization, the electrical component, followed the contraction, the mechanical component. What they can do and to aid in rhythm and rate management, uh, aside from that, is also mimic AV synchrony, okay? And so essentially they can, can provide an impulse to the atria and then also to the ventricles. So synchronized events. The other things, they, they essentially do, when you think of pacemakers, do two things. So the two things that they do is that they sense activity or detect activity, and then they can also trigger activity. So if you can't form an impulse, as we mentioned with sinus node dysfunction, they can trigger it. The other thing is that they're able to adapt to the function of the heart by sensing, so detecting activity, into the patient's activity through rate responsiveness. So if the patient it needs more activity or more uh, um, from that heart, it could increase that activity. Remember that they're capable of detecting and treating tachyarrhythmias, but the important thing here is that pacemakers are not benign. Okay. They carry risk and the potential for adverse effects, infection, and a lot of other issues that we'll learn about at another point. Now, the other things we want to keep in mind is that conduction system failures uh, can result in escape rhythms. And we talk about escape rhythms coming from those latent pacemakers, these are certainly not ideal. And as a result, there's those two shortcomings we mentioned, is that they have a decreased frequency that can result in a decreased cardiac output, and a lower cardiac output can result in symptoms. These are not reliable for long-term use because their activity may cease, that is the latent pacemakers, and result in asystole. Now, in terms of general pacemaker indications, this is, again, just broad brushes. Uh, there's two things that you should be aware of, okay, from the failure to generate or transmit impulses. This can result from defective impulse formation. And as we mentioned, with the patient uh, with sinus node dysfunction or a defect impulse conduction. So whether you're not forming it correctly or you're not conducting an impulse, as you can see with AV block. 
So those are the main things, okay, an overview highlighting some of the pacemaker things that we'll get into uh, in much more detail. Well, that's the end of this lesson. We discussed an overview of pacemakers, including the basics of cardiac pacings, as well as general indications for their use. I hope you learned something. Thank you.